later this week, Jesse, uh, about that thing we were discussing the other night. Yes, yes. Okay. Or next week. All right, well, we're getting close to the 12 o'clock mark. Um, and so far, we've got a, a nice showing of people. Um, welcome, everybody, to the Global Viewpoints Forum. If this is your first time um, joining us, I'll just go over a little bit about um, our sort a, of process. Can we Sorry, get a couple Josh? more minutes for people? Can we get a couple yeah, more minutes? Yeah, I'm just explaining. I'm just explaining muting. So okay. if you if you're on, um, you know, you keep your microphone muted during the presentations to eliminate sort of that background. People, people coming in, all that kind of stuff as best you can. Um, and then there'll be times when it's open for question and answer, in which case you can either write things in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, and basically, it, this is um, how the Global Viewpoints Forum runs. So we're at 12 o'clock. We have about 19 people on the call so far, and I expect that there'll be a number of other people joining in the next couple of minutes. But again, welcome to the Global Viewpoints Forum. Thank you for joining us the day uh, before the holiday weekend starts and um, hope that everybody is staying safe and healthy and warm and today. Um, my name is Mary Helmig. Um, I'm Vice President of Youth Initiatives at Legacy International. And today we're good. We have two uh, presenters Dan Harrison and Jesse Teasley. And uh, the structure will be um, sort of some presentations, welcoming remarks, they'll present, and then there'll be an open question and answer forum. Um, and then we'll be concluding. So uh, that's sort of the rough structure. Um, I wanted to just give a brief introduction. I know some of you might have read the bios that we had on our um, social media channels, et cetera. But I'd like to first introduce Jesse Tuals Teasley. He is an African Native American born on Long Island, New York, and he attended Roosevelt High School, Nassau Community College, and um, also Copen State College. So he spent a lot of time in, in the New York area and then also in Maryland. He majored in history and political science. He grew up in the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the Church of God in Christ, um, which is sometimes referred to as the Holy Rollers. And although he was a Christian, there were other parts of his upbringing where he was exposed to and had members of his family that were Muslim. So he spent many years studying the Quran and also Islamic Kung Fu. Um, not only that, but he also took the time to live on a Native American reservation, teaching Kung Fu, and not just teaching, but learning, learning the spirituality of his people, the Lakota Sioux. He was taught the way of the sweat lodge, the sacred pipe, and the way of the sun dance. And um, he is also a master of, in several martial arts, and he's been studying those for over 40 years. He went to China in 2000 to study Chinese boxing with the Grand Masters of Hong Kong, Wung Dong, and Shanghai martial arts traditions. He is a master of Chemitet, African boxing, Japanese karate, Tai Chi, and Chang Kuang, Kung Fu. I'm sure I didn't pronounce that properly, so please correct me. And he now spends his time teaching the ways of the ancient and believes that you can't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. So that's our good friend, Jesse. Um, also with us today is uh, Dan Teasley, I mean, Dan Harrison. <laughs> um, he's originally from Oklahoma and is a proud member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. His ancestors have even included prominent tribal leaders. He's always been drawn to doing spiritual work and social activism. And even as a high school student, you know, heard that call. And when he was 17 years old, was licensed to ministry by the Southern Baptist, while simultaneously serving as an assistant pastor at the Lawton's Indian Mission Church of God. 
He's served in several communities in Mexico, Texas, where he started churches um, with his wife, Ruth. And after finishing a degree in theology at Howard Payne University in Texas, he also attended the Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary in California, where he then finished all those graduate studies in the University of Nevada, Reno. So he's traveled quite a bit around the United States. He took a position in Kuwait University for seven years and then returned to the U.S. in 2010 with his four children and his wife and um, has, you know, eventually moved to Virginia to be closer to his father, but also close to Legacy International. And um, in response to the escalating racial tensions, he and Ruth are, have started a bilingual congregation, the Hearts United Community Church, and co-founded the Center for Diversity and Common Ground. Um, in 2017, he became a minister of the Church of the Covenant in Lynchburg, where he's busily working to help create a racial justice center with community partners, while also serving as an adjunct faculty member at the University of Lynchburg. So we're really grateful to both of you, to have you as our friends, and to have you shed some light on a very important subject today. So I'm going to throw it over to you, Mr. Ash, for the intro. Thank you. Thank you very much welcome everybody. I'm very happy, I'm honored and full of joy today to have my two dear friends speak at our Global Viewpoints Forum. I hope and pray that the good of today with all its light and its blessings and with all its hope and affirmation for unity and peace remains with you all this day and throughout the evening and through the night. Nature calls out to us about the efficacy of change. Our senses see and smell the transitions from season to season. From my window right now, I see the many varieties of birds and squirrels. Later, we'll see the raccoons and the deer and other family members eating vor voraciously and storing up for winter's rest. The trees have shed their garb and are resting in anticipation of spring's renewal and vibrancy. And again today, we are challenged to be patient till circumstances change, but we cannot also be inactive. As winter approaches here in Virginia, below the surface, the roots of the trees, the hibernating animals, the dormant seeds still pulsate with life. So too, as we are in a forced hibernation due to the pandemic, as we see society shed the past and hope to recover anew, as we feel the necessity to pause and to open our senses to change, there is the necessity also to embrace transformation and to stay active and to rectify the ills of society to plan for the future. This is the work of Legacy International and our talented and dedicated staff. You know, so much of the past, its history and perceptions have been manipulated and distorted due to ignorance and greed and prejudice and frustration. So much of the present is resounding with conflict and the suppression of universal values. We have witnessed the attempts to elevate fear and disdain for others. We have good reason to have concern for the future. We must act now to rectify the past. And we have seen once again what happens when racism incites violence and anarchy. We are living in a new globalized world replete with lies and revisionist ideologies. And as a result, it's hard to see and even harder to accept the truth about ourselves and to find a path to healing and to peace. Yet the realization that we share one ancestry, one humanity, one set of intrinsic universal values, which if embraced can and will rectify those ills, mental, emotional, physical, and, uh, and physical and spiritual must be pursued and they have to be affirmed. So today, once again, Come back, just hang on a minute. An opportunity to begin to change. Today, once again, our Global Review Points Forum and our mutual concern work for the benefit of others and affords us an opportunity to, at the very least, open the door to knowledge and truth, an opportunity to begin to rectify that past. Today, it ostensibly is in terms of Native Americans, but the subject of true warriors is one of human capability and is reflective of universal truth and the universal experience that whatever, wherever the indigenous people live or lived and wherever human beings fear the other, a story must be told 
and intention and action must follow to create justice and fairness. Everywhere on this earth, we find similar conflict, the similar history, the need for transformation to our higher self, our duty to be humane and loving people. Legacy International's commitment to and foundation lies in the affirmation of universal values. As I mentioned so many times already, compassion and justice and patience and equality and equity and love and service to all. So we encourage others to join us in reflecting on our own purposes, to create a new tomorrow today that creates harmony with others, with the earth, with spirit, and addresses practically the day-to-day -day necessities. Today's guests are my personal friends and brothers in that spirit. They have vast experience serving others locally and globally. Both reach deeply into their own hearts and souls to share a message of love and action. Their work is partially built on the harsh realities of the past, but also the knowledge and experience that there is light that shines on the horizon of the future and that that future is built every day. My friends, it takes courage and perseverance to live the values we espouse. And every culture has its dark side and struggles, but given opportunity and support, the sun, the moon will shine their light and nurture change for good. They both strive every day to create a new tomorrow today. So Dan and Jesse, thank you for being patient with my introduction and please take us on a journey. Thank you, uh, shukran Sheikh. Hello everyone, salam alaikum, shalom alaikum, shalom. Saludos, halito, um, greetings. Jesse probably wants to give some greetings. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jesse and I are, are so grateful uh, for this opportunity. I think it's, uh, it's wonderful that uh, to, to be with Legacy International and in and, and this community, and it's always a, a pleasure for us, I know. And, um, and we're so, I think, honored because Jesse and I are both kind of sons of the indigenous and sons of empire at the same time. You know, we're the products of of the things that happened on, on this continent. And, um, and uh, so we, we're walking stories of, of, the, of the tragedies and, and, and also resiliency. And so we're, uh, we're, we're obviously all close friends, but, uh, but I think Jesse and I wanted to start to share our story a little bit more today by starting with the Thanksgiving holiday, which we celebrate in the United States. Um, and so I'm gonna get us started with that. Just a little bit of, little bit of uh, history here for those who may or may not be familiar with our holiday. So we've had this holiday for quite a while. Um, it, it, it's, it has a European birth um, a bit. The idea of Thanksgiving in a sense of a meal. Um, it has some religious roots, Christian religious roots, I think, for for the uh, for this particular country. Um, and it was made official. It was made official in, I believe, 1863, uh, by uh, the, the the president at the time, Abraham Lincoln, who wanted to uh, officialize it in in November. So we celebrate this as a country every year um, at the at the last Thursday of this month. So that will be for for us. It will be this this week. Um, but Thanksgiving comes with it a mythology that started in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and that mythology is as depicted right there. The, it's, it's a, um, a, a known story in our, um, in our American uh, history that we share from generation to generation starting very young. And so this story depicts the settlers, as they're called, or pilgrims um, in, in, at Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts, um, in, eight, in 1621. So there is said that a feast was, you know, took place between the local uh, native tribe there and um, the Wampanoag people and, um, and then the pilgrims and that they celebrated some sort of uh, togetherness and in order to survive the winter together. So here's the story. I mean, here's the picture of that story. Um, but we, we, we all know, most of us anyway, that that's not really um, exactly a great depiction 
of the relationship uh, then and especially the relationship after. Um, in large part, the story is about white European pilgrims um, coming to the continent and finding a moment of peace and togetherness with the native peoples as depicted in the picture. Um, but who, who are really the Americans in that story are, are not the native Americans. Really people see the Americans as the pilgrims themselves. And so it's this, uh, it's a, a little bit of a lopsided story, especially since just within two decades of this story, um, the son of the chief, his head would be hanging, uh, decapitated, hanging on a pike um, um, at the fort right there at Plymouth. So th it's just a, not an unrealistic story. Um, it, this is probably a better depiction of what, of what especially the native peoples would experience um, the aggression from the European settlers or the colonists. Jesse, maybe we'll add a little bit more to that story um, just thinking about how this has taken away the voices of Native Americans. Jesse, did you want to add anything to that? Um, no, not right now. Not right now. So the Thanksgiving mythology, we're calling it a mythology because it's not a true depiction, um, has been handed down from gener generation to generation to children, school children, learning the story of how uh, the pilgrims, the original colonists, and uh, lived in peace with the Native Americans. As we all know, simply by, simply by the statistics, simply by understanding uh, what has happened to the Native American populations is that this is, not, this is not a true story. It's not a true depiction. It is a mythology because all you need to do is look around. Um, many of the tribes in America are extinct. Um, hundreds of them have vanished uh, due to extermination. Many and all the others have been corralled and 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 uh, put onto uh, uh, reservations, um, places for them, uh, internment camps or whatever you want to call them, places where they're to stay, and um, and so and, and weren't even granted um, citizenship in the United States till uh, 1924. So the Thanksgiving story, the Thanksgiving story is a mythology. But what it does, it has this lasting effect of teaching American children, especially, that everything between the colonists and the natives uh, of, of this continent are okay, are at peace, are, are fine. And so it takes away any, any voice for justice and it kind of removes the need to advocate for Native American rights. Um, Indigenous people of this country can be seen as, as earth allies, initially, uh, siblings to the earth. They have a different perspective. We have a different perspective of the earth in general, but especially in, in relationship, not only with fellow humans, but with, with the earth itself. And this isn't just indigenous people here. It's indigenous people everywhere. And I'd like to use the word earthborn cultures. I, I, the reason I say this, we all descend from earthborn cultures. We all descend from tribes that were very close to the earth. Um, but some of us more recently than others, our tribes or our earthborn cultures are, are still recently connected in that way with the earth, uh, calling the earth its mother, calling um, the trees its brothers and sisters, um, treating life as if we're all in some sort of symbiotic relationship, uh, a spiritual and biological uh, physical and metaphysical way. And so I'm using it in that specific way just to give a little definition. But so indigenous peoples have always been, um, earthborn culture people have always been allies or siblings with the earth and its many components. But what has happened because of, um, because of the uh, aggression of, of colonization, imperialism, um, it has forced indigenous people to move away from simple allies and siblings of the earth and become protectors or warriors to protect the earth. And it's forced them into a defensive posture or an advocating posture. And, and so this is where we are terming this term eco warriorism, this idea where we all aren't just siblings of the earth, but now we must in fact protect it from our own selves, from the aggression of humankind. 
And so we want to lean on our uh, eco warrior, natural earthborn culture people, indigenous people, for various reasons. Um, Jesse, did you want to add anything to the idea of eco warriorism? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> okay. Well, here's 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 our next example. So we wanted to talk a little bit about how eco warriorism has forced tribes again, to move from just an allied position with the earth to, to a more advocating protector of the earth. And so, and this has just become more and more pronounced in our cultures um, over these past few years. We can really see it in the past couple, three years. And one of the biggest um, issues, and uh, this is Jesse's tribe, so he'll talk about it, but is, um, is from Standing Rock in North Dakota. Jesse, you want to give us more information on that? Yeah, Standing Rock. Um, well, before I talk about Standing Rock, I just want to put in contrast uh, the eco-warriorism, the indigenous people, what we're fighting against is really a Greco-Roman white male rapist culture. That's what we're really fighting against. Greco-Roman white male rapist culture. One that thinks about raping women, raping men, but raping the eco system, raping uh, our, 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 uh, our woods, our land, our, our, our waters. So this is what we're really fighting against. So here in South Dakota, I mean, North Dakota is Standing Rock, uh, which is the home of my people. Uh, a Canadian company. And again, Canadians are, are basically, uh, you know, let's say a French culture, uh, uh, English French culture, but English and French cultures are basically Greco-Roman cultures. The Greco-Romans conquered England, they conquered France and France and England are what Americans and Canadians are made up of. We're made up of that same culture, English, French, Greco-Roman culture. And so these, uh, a company in Canada that uh, produces oil, wants to ship that oil down to the, uh, the Gulf Coast. And so they're coming with a pipeline through the border of Saskatchewan and, uh, and down through North Dakota and originally this pipeline was supposed to go in Bismarck, North Dakota, above Bismarck, North Dakota is where the pipeline was supposed to go. But when those people in Bismarck, when those white males in Bismarck heard that a pipeline was going across their water system, they said, hell no, we're not having a pipeline of oil go across our water system. And so the Canadians, the descendants of French people, French and English speaking people, they said, okay, we won't put the pipeline in front of Bismarck. So they brought the pipeline and put it right in front of my reservation, Standing Rock Reservation, going across the Missouri River. And they've intended on uh, doing that since, uh, I guess, 2012 was when they started. But uh, so the pipeline is supposed to go right across the river, which is in endangering my reservation, which is right below it. So um, President Obama, when he was in the office, stopped that pipeline from crossing over the river. Because of, uh, President Trump got into office he let the pipeline go again. And so they started rebuilding it. And so what happened was we got a lot of support from around the country, from around the world, uh, people coming to the reservation, uh, protesting this pipeline. And so um, even though President Trump said that the pipeline could go through, the issue went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court refused to uh, overturn the ruling of the lower court, which said, no, that pipeline could not go through over the Missouri River, over Standing Rock Reservation because of uh, ecological reasons. But it's not dead yet. It's just on hold because now what the pipeline people have to do is produce uh, ecological studies 
that sufficiently show that their pipeline isn't going to cause our reservation harm. But um, that's just where it's at right now. Thank you, Jesse. That's a, an example. That's one of the best examples of in recent years of just native indigenous in our in our continent uh, solidarity. We have, I think, over 50 tribes that have shown up to stand with uh, the Lakota at, at Standing Rock and uh, Choctaw, yay, are one of them, but there are many. And uh, it's, it's, it's a powerful testament to uh, indigenous folks. Um, I'm just, just tired of resources being raped and, and taken from them over and over. And that's, and that's the story of, of Oklahoma as well. And uh, those who are um, Americans uh, certainly hopefully know something of the story of Oklahoma. Oklahoma is the place the destination for the Trail of Tears that took tribes from the eastern coast and moved them from the southeast and moved them into this uh, into this land, uh, which was uh, the Indian Territory at the time when they, when this happened in the 1830s. But um, but uh, but now what happened, of course, over time is the uh, white colonists, white settlers again uh, took came into uh, this particular uh, location and uh, began to, to take swaths of it and, and, uh, and shrunk uh, these, these nations. There's 39 tribes in Oklahoma and there is a hierarchy there of tribes and I don't wanna necessarily get into all of our internal politics, but, but these five tribes that you see here on this, on this particular um, uh, map are, are the five originally arriving from the uh, Trail of Tears tribes. Um, starting with the Choctaw people, which which is my people, but these are all actually cousin cousin groups. They they all speak cousin languages, uh, except the Cherokee. Cherokee are, are slightly they're like second cousins, but um, <laughs> but but that entire group uh, used to exist um, in the southeastern part of the United States. And what's happened now, just this year, is pretty significant, and that's why I wanted to, to mention it. Standing Rock was a very big turning point, I think, for Indigenous peoples for. Uh, standing together and and gaining the popular, I think, a lot of popular uh, support uh, from dominant culture, majority culture folks in the United States too. But here we have Oklahoma, who which was initially reservations, and then settlers took parts of it, has just had a Supreme Court decision just a, a handful of months ago um, that upheld an 1866 treaty. Uh, for the Muscogee Nation, which the, all five tribes have treaties from that same time and pretty much the same language with the United States that uh, gave sovereignty to these nations once again and defined their borders. Um, the Supreme Court holding up a, 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 or, or recognizing these nations or the Muscogee Nation, um, a, a, what it does is it puts back again uh, the sovereignty of, of these tribes and their borders, which is a, a very significant thing. And I'll say the reason why. This is 44% of the state of Oklahoma, technically is actually reservation land, sovereign reservation land. Now, a lot of Oklahoma is reservation land, but this of other tribes, we have 39 tribes in Oklahoma. But for these five tribes, these are the original five that came on the Trail of Tears. Th these nations are, are pretty large and, um, and their borders are, are being recognized now. As, as officially uh, sovereign nations. Um, so now this is putting Oklahoma in, in a bit of in dominant culture, a Greco-Roman culture, as Jesse so eloquently put it. Uh, he, could have, he, he, he could have added Christian, we're not here to offend, but it is Greco-Roman Christian. It, Christi, Christianity has really it, it become the modern uh, vessel for, for a lot of that, but which is unique because uh, we're, we're Christians, but we understand, we understand this. So here we are in, in Oklahoma, and, um, and Oklahoma is in a bit of a, of a predicament as a state because 44% of the state is technically not theirs. Um, and they don't, may ha not have, they definitely don't have jurisdictional uh, uh, reign over them in any way, um, authority, but they definitely don't have, and they don't have probably taxation authority. And so these tribes are all pretty, I mean, they, 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 they have money. It's a little bit different than other situations uh, of other parts, other, other tribes, um, because they have uh, allowed people to own land on their reservations. This is a unique situation. So there's a lot of white landowners that, are, that own land in these nations, 
Um, but they are under the nation of the Choctaw Nation, Chickasaw Nation, Seminole, Muscogee, and Ch Cherokee Nation. So this is a very, very interestingly complex new situation that has arisen, um, but uh, is forcing tribes here to once again kind of stand up against uh, state state rule in their in their in their in their in their own nations, and um, it is quite interesting. The reason I bring any we bring these things up is to explain there is a problem when 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 we don't apply the indigenous we don't understand the histories and the stories of the native peoples of the land, and I wanted to start and I meant to start earlier by acknowledging the land that we're on here in, in Lynchburg, Virginia and Bedford County um, and, and all around this area of the United States is the land of the Monacan people. And we wanna acknowledge that we're on their land, not by invitation. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and that needs to be rectified, but that's a, good, that's a good point, is to understand the native stories and histories of the, of the land where you're at. And this goes all around the world, right? Who are the native peoples of the land where you're at and inviting those earth-born cultures to the table. Um, I know Jesse's got quite a bit about that. He could probably explain. And, and, then, and then if you don't have native people, the indigenous people from that area at the table, like for the pipeline for the resources in Oklahoma, like a lot of the nations, the Indian nations there have their, their oil, there's oil there, there's coal, and, and all sorts of natural resources, not, not just water, but all these other things that are money makers that are, 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 be, are the reason why states and governments have a hard time giving sovereignty, letting go, letting go uh, and, 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 and honoring the sovereignty of these nations. Did you wanna add anything to that, Jesse? Uh, no, nope, not really. So we ask all of you these questions and, and the question, yeah, the questions um, that we wanted to ask everyone is, who are the native voices in your area? Uh, all around the world. I mean, it's, there's native people, there are, there are indigenous folks there. And are, are those oppressed people or, or are those in, in control people? Or, or, and are they, are you learning those stories? Is that part of, of the education where you're at? Is that something you're per personally pursuing, the histories of the land that you're in? And, and are you leveraging uh, those local, that local indigenous wisdom in your own initiatives in your community? Are you partnering? Are you collaborating rather than simply um, imposing? So these are the questions we offer for discussion today. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause here. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we can open it up for uh, discussion, um, considering those questions or any other questions you may have. And feel yeah. free to unmute yourself or just type your uh, comments or thoughts in the chat. Dan and Jesse, I just, I wanna, you know this, but I wanna tell everybody that we've always had the, we've always spoken here at Legacy on our, on our property as the privilege of of being on the land of the Monacans and Blue Eagle, uh, who I think passed not too long ago. And, and his wife, uh, Carol, used to come out every summer for our Global Youth Village and, and dance and, and in the regalia and the beautiful ribbon shirts that she made and gave lectures and he, and he, he uh, I was honored to become a pipe a hold, a holder of the pipe for the Monacans, and so and that has been a big struggle here, and as you know, in the Lynchburg and Bedford area, about them getting recognition from the from the government. But one of the first things, and people who have been on. Steps, which down by our stream, there's a big granite outcropping, and to climb up to the top of, I was looking how to get to the top of it without going around the back of it, and I found carved in the carved in the stone steps the, that that you could climb up the side, and that was really a very great moment uh, of realization for me about why this land was a very sacred land for the type of work that we tried to do, that we wanted to do spiritually and 
and ethically and internationally here to bring people together from all from diverse sides. So I hope and I pray that we're keeping up some semblance of the tradition as we are overseers of this land. And I wanted to share that with the people. Yeah, I wanted to make a, a, a point, a question regarding land ownership. Um, I'm Stephen Gomes, and I've worked a lot with indigenous people. Uh, Mitakwe Oyasin. I, hey. Hey, aho. <laughs> aho. Uh, I uh, was adopted by the uh, Sam Moves Camp of Medicine Man of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. I've worked with them for 30 years. And one of the things that the tribes were forced into doing is putting their land up for sale when it was against their interest. I don't know exactly which president did that, but I think it was President Reagan who made tribal lands available for sale outside of the tribal ownership, which created tremendous problems that Dan was referring to. And it's not just in Oklahoma, but it's for all the tribes everywhere. Um, I don't know if there's any way of reversing that, but now, for example, in the Oglala Sioux tribe in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, there's many white cattle ranchers that have come in and they have no interest in supporting what the tribe does. Uh, so it's created a huge problem. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that, Dan. Yeah, I, I, in recent years, I can't because ours started so long ago. So Oklahoma's land grab starts with um, the Dawes Rolls. And I know all of you, well, probably have heard of Dawes. It is, a, uh, it is something that Senator Dawes started, I think, in the 1880s, an initiative um, out of Massachusetts because he couldn't understand the concept of communal ownership. And um, he, he was, pet I mean, just terrified by uh, when he went through Oklahoma, he didn't understand how everyone was farming the land. And he asked who owned it. And they just said the tribe. And they di he didn't understand it, it. He said, that's that's the scariest thing if, 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 if people don't own the land themselves. And so individually, um, this kind of communal spirit was contrarian to him. So he, so he created the Dawes roles. And what that did was it, it allocated uh, everybody registered through the late 1800s, early 1900s in, in the tribes in Oklahoma. And that's how, and everybody was uh, uh, allotted a certain amount of acreage. So 160 or 100 acres, depending on your tribe, per person or per family. And then it shrunk all the area to the population. That's why Seminole and Muskogee Creek shrunk. It shrunk all their, <laughs> this promised land. And even Choctaw, every Choctaw had like the whole bottom half of Oklahoma and it just shrunk everybody. Cherokee had the whole top, hat, whole top part of Oklahoma, shrunk it down to that small area. And then, and then from there, just like you said, uh, Stephen, that's exactly what happened. Um, um, opportunists came and uh, swindled, uh, bought uh, land from the, the natives. And it just, it just one thing after another until they had acquired all this land within these nations. And uh, that's why the city of Tulsa is in the Muscogee Nation. It's a city, Tulsa, but it's actually Muscogee land. And at any time, they, Muscogee could, you know, say, hey, we want to take our land. We want all this back. Um, McAllister is my city and Durant. And there's cities. I mean, there's cities on these lands um, that, that are owned by, by, by white folks. And so it's a very... Very, very, very difficult. So I, apparently what you're saying, I didn't know anything about this, to be honest. I didn't know this had happened at other reservations. I thought this was unique to Oklahoma. Um, so if this has happened somewhere else later after the Dawes rolls, wow, that's new to yeah, me. Yeah, no, it, it is it's a terrible, terrible situation. And what I understand from it is that it was because they couldn't, you know, all the tribes were supposed to be totally assimilated by now. And what happened is it, it didn't happen. It, it, the tribes surprised everybody. They set the laws up in such a way that all this was supposed to be gone. There was going to be no more budget, no more money spent on the tribes because they were all going to be assimilated, become good white people. Well, that never happened. And uh, so now, because that didn't happen, they had to come up with another way to try to assimilate the tribes out of that land because they want the land. 
It's what they really want. And they want what's underneath the land. So they came up with this idea of making it mandatory for the Indians, Native Americans to be able to sell their lands. And of course, Native Americans are like anybody, they need money. So they, a lot of them were able to, you know, be enticed to sell their heritage away, which then gave the tribal governments huge problems because now they, they have this situation where they have so many white cattle ranchers and other people on within their tribal boundaries and it's creating lots and lots of tension. Jesse, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, that's that's uh, amazing. Well, the only thing I can think of, and uh, Steve, I'm from the same Kayoshpe uh, Moves Camp, Kayoshpe. Oh, uh, I'm my uh, my Native American name that he gave me personally is Juan um, Leohitika. Uh, ah, <laughs> wow, wow, that's, my, that's, re that's really great. Really I great. Live up to it on the good red road. On the good red road. Yep. Yeah, the only thing that I can think is that we have to organize, and I think it's easier now to organize because of social media and uh, just go one on one with uh, the new incoming president and, and vice president and with our, our senators. We have to address it, we have to organize, we have to address it, in, uh, and I'm sure there are things that could be done to uh, reverse those uh, harmful and, and, and harmful policies that are uh, made just to, again, to rape, to rape the land, to rape the people. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a really big shame because in my life with living with Native Americans, I also live with the Mataponi tribe uh, in uh, Jamestown which was the original, that tribe, their, their uh, tribal um, contract is not with America, it's with the British because they were there even mm -hmm. before there was them in America. And mm -hmm. they still have a little piece of their tribal lands left, but their, their relationship is, I don't know how that even works because they were part of the original British uh, tribal agreement. So anyway, this is the only thing I can say is that coming back now, the earth needs tribal wisdom. I mean, when you look at the uh, Oglala Sioux tribe, they've been there for 10,000 years and we've been here for 300 years. Mm -hmm, the wisdom mm -hmm. that you learn from 10,000 years has got to be paid attention to now for yeah. humanity to survive and for the earth and mother earth to sustain itself. Yeah, and that's what and that's what we're about. We're about trying to engage the indigenous cultures to uh, join up with, or in, to get the, the, the popular community to join up with the indigenous culture when they're thinking about building, when they're thinking about uh, renovating, when they're thinking about uh, changing the land. Mm -hmm. uh, indigenous people should be a part of that uh, task force to see how it should be done, to see, you know, who's going to be harmed, to see what what should be done. Uh, indigenous people, their voice should be at that table, and they're not, and that's, that's a global issue. Yeah, the, the uh, World Indigenous Council is now speaking up in the world. They just went to Stockholm, and they met there, and Joy T. Ma, who is part of that whole movement, She's going around the world uh, helping to organize indigenous people everywhere to, to gain power in their voice and have their voice heard at this crucial, critical time of chaos. And this chaos is not gonna end. It's gonna keep on going because what white men have created is not sustainable. It is simply not sustainable. And as time goes and moves forward, we're gonna find out that more and more people are gonna realize we cannot sustain this this bankrupt system and we have to go back to rules of mother nature that are in compliance with the sustainability and equitably equitable equitable distribution of wealth for all people 
So thank you so much for, for this, it, this part of the dialogue, because the question is what if, that you pose to the group. I think it's really opened my mind to understanding the tribe's problems around ownership of their land, who's trying to get at their land. Um, and I recently, what, what the Global Youth Village has done for the last 15 or 20 years has brought young people from the Crow Reservation, Northern Cheyenne Reservation, the Navajo Reservations, all those places. And some of those young people are now in these positions of advocacy. So one young woman, um, Crystal Rain Tubals, is um, part of a land campaign and off of the Northern Cheyenne Reservation now. And it's like, I knew nothing about, well, what's that about? So I think one, one thing that's an outcome of today's conversation is just to understand that. But if you both if, had advice for any of us, you know, or, or some of the young people that might be watching this later to begin to understand and really get deeper into this knowledge of the Native American experience, what would you advise? I know there's sometimes volunteer opportunities on reservations like what's the best ways that you guys can can describe on how to become more aware and more engaged and more involved with the personal stories i mean I, i've got some thoughts i think that wherever you're at and it, it is a it is in our it is in our best global interest um to to uh to, to begin to uh, make friendship and relationship with those on whose land you occupy, wherever you're at. I mean, who are the ancestral people of that place? And, uh, and to, uh, to spend time learning from them, listening to their stories and finding out what those needs are instead of, instead of you know, throwing up a clinic or, or operating some sort of uh, initiative on your own. I think it needs to be, I think, I think it's, it's time for, for folks to, especially if you're from an imperial culture, which a lot of us are, a lot of us are <laughs> children of empire, um, is, to, is to instead humble ourselves before the, before the, the, you know, the, the indigenous people of that place and, uh, and start to ask what those needs are. Like if we were with the Monacan people here, just, just talking locally and just recently recognized, they've been in a fight for decades to be recognized as a, as a tribe, just recently recognized uh, two years ago. If if we were to go there and 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 begin a relationship, it would be of of how how you know find out what those needs are, and then you'll find out what the needs and the struggles are. And the struggles are land, and the struggles are resources. I mean that that those are definitely their struggles and language um, and all sorts of things and culture. So uh, just trying to revive those things. So there's there's uh, and that's what I've done here. So when I came here, that's what I did. I, I spent time with their council and. And, uh, and started trying to help with a language program um, mm -hmm. to revive the dead language of Tutelo. So these are the things that we, we wanna do. We wanna humble ourselves, I think. Jesse, what are your thoughts? I'm thinking um, maybe on a, a bigger scale, we can join like online and support the World Indigenous uh, Council uh, because the more voices that they have, the more contacts that they have, the more influence I think they have. And in that way, you can stay uh, abreast on what's going on around the world. And Jesse, um, just to follow up, um, because you and I had the benefit of talking to you and Dan prior to this call, but I think there's also so much that was done to the Native American population to force that assimilation, but in essence, destroy them um, and, you know, imprison them. I just, I didn't know the imprisoning of Native Americans in Florida happened. It's just so many things. So uh, how do you propose some of the, the reconciliation or just acknowledgement of those past travesties, travesties occur? Do you have any thoughts on that or? You know, uh, first it has to be acknowledgement of it. And uh, and and universal, uh, you know, the country has to come to grips with those things that happen also. But the country, by and large, is just you know, oh, that's a long time ago. It happened in the past. Just let it go. But until we face up uh, to what we've done as a nation, until we face up to our past, our true past, and acknowledge those things that have happened, uh, we we can't really move forward. 
Uh, I just want to point out that there's a new question coming in from the chat from Gina. Um, has the UN General Assembly resolution of the 2010s been of any aid to you in the work that you're taking on? So I'm thinking that applies to either of you if you want to chime in. I think it's the... So, well, it's good to get that recognition from the UN, but uh, um, it's, it's just another point on our list of, of grievances on on to help us so but but uh on a day on a daily basis it really hasn't been of any help other than you know the support it's good to have the support and the recognition from the UN. I, I was going to say the UN any UN resolution um typically has little to no effect in the United States itself this is a very insulated uh place uh, which is wildly strange um and uh, as you all know, so I mean, there's not much to say to that, but I think that that's always a, a very interesting, very interesting thing. Why, why does the UNHCR not operate in our borders? Why does the UNHCR not operate on our, on our um, outside of our borders, but nearby? There's all sorts of political reasons why the UN has little to no effect into what happens in, inside our country. And, uh, and that's just extremely unfortunate. I wanted to say a little bit about that too, that the, the, exactly what Dan just said is United Nations has almost no effect uh, in what they say among the tribal relations in the United States. What I would suggest is look to the north in Canada where the tribes there have been able to gain much more traction than we are here. And what, what I would suggest and then what I talked about with the elders of the Oglala Sioux tribe, Pine Ridge, and, and others in, of the Lakota people is to have reconvened the great council uh, of all the U.S. major tribes and sit down with the new leadership in Washington and try to establish a, a, a new dialogue in which some kind of reparations are made to Native Americans because I've lived on those tribes and I've been there and it is, if, if any white people actually had that experience, they would come back with a whole different attitude if they were real people because it's, it's just beyond belief. I mean, you wouldn't even, you can't even believe that it's happening in the United States, what you see there, uh, people, walk out and freeze to death in the wintertime, just walking because they can't, they don't have a car, they don't have any transportation, they can't get anywhere. It's 20, 30 below zero, they walk and they just want to go to their neighbor, they don't make it, they just die right there in the street. I mean, it's it's bad, it's bad as, I, I lived in uh, Brazil in the Peace Corps and it was better down there in my village with no running water and no electricity than it was on, places in the Pine Ridge. It was just, you can't believe it. You literally cannot believe it, that we've done this. We white people have done this. And somehow I think all the tribes have to come together and have a great council and get that out so that maybe this administration might deal with it in a better, more open way. Thanks. I actually was wondering if I could ask a question. So um, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. It was awesome. Uh, and Mr. Harrison in particular, it's amazing that you worked on the Tudelo Revitalization Project. I love language revitalization. Um, and it is actually, I had a question about kind of land and language and the relationship there between um, so I study linguistics at Cornell right now and something that's very frustrating for me to see um, and has been since the beginning is that there is a lot of much of the field of linguistics relies on indigenous knowledge, either explicitly or implicitly, um, because the languages that indigenous peoples have historically spoken and continue to speak um, teach us a lot fundamentally about how language works and human cognition. So there's a great deal of focus placed on um, data sets or problem sets or certain sample sentences from various languages. Um, in order to understand fundamental concepts of linguistics, but then a lot of times, and this is maybe a Cornell particular problem, but I think broadly there's a focus on theoretical linguistics, understanding how language works on an abstract level, and then no actual connection to the people that speak the languages upon which these theories um, and understandings of cognition are based. 
Um, and so you get kind of an insulated theoretical linguistics crowd that's like, oh yeah, I studied, you know, Cherokee grammar, but has no actual connection to Cherokee people. Or I studied, you know, um, Cayuga and Seneca grammars, but I don't have any connection to those people whatsoever and have never kind of engaged with them. So I guess my first question is just kind of broadly, could you speak a little bit to the connection between language and land? Because I know that that's something that's really, really important um, in kind of all studies. And then second of all, what can be done, do you think, to kind of create stronger relationships or between, I guess, create a more equitable distribution of like linguistic knowledge capital um, between academics and the communities that they may study at a distance. Um, because I think that it's just, it's very frustrating to me to constantly see people using indigenous languages with, or having a great deal of knowledge about these languages, being experts in them, and then never applying that to actually helping to revitalize or assist kind of these peoples in regaining a degree of like linguistic sovereignty and kind of um, control over their own languages future. So I, I think, do you, I guess in particular, Mr. Harrison, with your experience in a language revitalization project and um, looking at language documentation more broadly, could you speak to that? Um, because I think that's a really important future direction in the field. Yeah, no, those are, those are great points, uh, Ms. Layton. I appreciate that. I was just gonna say that I mean, obviously, language and, and uh, culture are, 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 are interconnected or, or reflective of one another. And to lose one is to lose the other in many ways. We all know that. Any keeper of the language understands the importance of that. As you know, there's only been one great revitalization of a language uh, on, on the mass scale that in, in our recent history that we know about. And, and of course, it's, uh, it's Hebrew. And um, it, and so, but it gives everyone hope, right? That 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 possibly these extinct, more extinct languages of the indigenous folks can be, can be uh, can be somehow revitalized. And um, uh, there is hope in that. But I I was just going to say, it it is power. Language is power, and I think everybody knows that. Everyone in this room here knows this because some of us are speaking, or we're all speaking English. We are speaking English because it is the language of empire. It is the imperial language that has dominated and is dominating a, a lot of the world in so many ways. Um, I did do my, I did doctoral work on, on, on ling linguistic imperialism. So I, I'm with it, I understand it a bit. And I just wanted to say that um, uh, the, the integrity of language is so critical. I, it, is to, it is literally to rub out people and nations and cultures by, by, by having them feel inferior with their language, with native languages, it, is, it has always been the case. Um, my people, the Choctaw people, are very uh, a docile people, right? So that we're, we're one of the ones that was easily, easy, easy to trade with. So we're trading with the French or we're trading with the English. It was just easy to do. And because of that, we also intermarried a lot. We, we've had people that are uh, married in with from the 1600s with uh, settlers, French trappers and, and English uh, settlers. It is, it is a long history. And in, in, in all of those hundreds of years of interacting with colonists, um, the language has always been an issue. Um, and even to this, I mean, Oklahoma's story is, is quite phenomenal because it housed most of the boarding schools, Indian boarding schools in this country. So people were, were sent off to, to un disconnect their language and culture, cut their hair, change their religion, traditions, everything. I mean, we, we live in this incredible story of, of resilience, really, for people that have been able to overcome this. So to answer the question, of course, you know the magnitude, you know the effects and, and, and the urgency with which I think someone like yourself would, would jump into these things. And I... Um, and I think there is a disconnection a lot of times with linguists, like uh, just just regular, normal, everyday variety linguists and and culture and keepers of culture, right? So there's such a difference. Uh, there usually linguists are really really they're kind of almost like that mathematical mind. They're finding formulas and they're and they're intrigued by curiosities of language and just these very interesting things. And then um, and and doing the historical research and trying to understand it. But they don't always understand the cultural and and that's not always something they're not all anthropologists too or sociologists and and so it's a there's a disconnection that happens in linguistics that 
that, that has happened also with our recording of languages. I mean, there's so much to get into here. I, I, I don't even know what the question was now that I'm kind of rambling um, mm -hmm. because I'm thinking of the effects of this. Um, but I'm from a fortunate tribe, so is Jesse. Our languages are intact, right? There's 40,000 native speakers of Choctaw. I, I don't know how many native speakers of Lakota, but it, uh, of, uh, of their languages, but uh, uh, the Sioux language, but I know there are many, <laughs> tens of thousands, if not more. And so we are lucky. We, we're like the luckiest tribes because we've been able to keep our languages. Um, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I uh, actually was thinking a little bit about uh, the question you posed, like who are the native voices in your area? And I'm originally from Connecticut where there are two federally recognized tribes, which are the Mashantucket Pequots and the Mohegans. And both of those have gone into the gaming industry um, and built large casinos. And I was just curious what your thoughts are on that type of model working elsewhere. If it's been, you know, you think it's a positive move, it's, in, is it a feasible move? Is it, you know, does it bring good to the community or, or not? What are the issues surrounding that or your thoughts? That's like a political question or a religious question, I think sometimes, I don't know. <laughs> revenue is revenue. <laughs> I went up there to that Pequot uh, reservation for a powwow that they had one year. And uh, the feedback that I got was, was, was pretty negative because the reservation, they opened up the casino and the casino was making a lot of money. And each person on that reservation, I forgot how much money they got, like some incredible amount of money mm -hmm. uh, every month as uh, revenue from the casino. And what it did was it took the reservation, which was poor, just like uh, Steve was saying, Eagle Man was saying that uh, the reservation was poor, had, had always been poor. People had never used, had never gotten used to having money. And so when they started getting these checks, every month from the reservation from the casino then you know liquor drugs fast cars all combine to really take a, a, a negative effect there were so many uh, suicides there were so many deaths mm -hmm. by car accidents there were so many deaths uh, drunk drunken accidents because the people now had money which they never had before so in some ways it's good but in a lot of ways the reservations around the country that have, have gone from poor to extremely rich in a short amount of time has uh, led to really horrible results thank you Um, I just had one question and then I think we can um, see if there's anything else out there. But before I ask mine, is there anybody else in the audience that wants to ask a question? Before yeah. we go Feel free to question. unmute yourself or just type in the chat. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, Steve brought up the poverty, extreme poverty. You know, all the friends that I know on the Crow Reservation that are still living in homes without running water. We saw the Navajo Nations, um, the effect of COVID on the Navajo Nation. What is it about our relationship with these, whether it's the treaties or the federal policies where the assistance isn't getting to alleviate that sort of extreme poverty? Is that because of the sovereignty issues and the tribes wanting to maintain the right to make these decisions on their own. Like, I know that's a really complex, probably very complex, but if you can give me some insight as to how this is still prevalent in the United States today, what is it that we're, we as a collective are not doing to alleviate that kind of extreme poverty? I was just gonna say, I was going to say that for the Choctaw, it's or, or the the tribe, the five tribes anyway of, of Oklahoma, it's um it's a little bit different because we've just been there a long, long time. Um, we were the first forced into these reservation situations, um, and and have had a lot of time to cultivate um, ways of surviving, 
it doesn't mean we don't have each of us have or our tribes have. And I was going to say, it's not a monolith. It's so, it varies so much from tribe to tribe and um, place to place, state to state, reservation, to reservation, and the, and the stories. I lived in Lawton, Oklahoma, which is where the Comanche Kiowa Apache live in Oklahoma. And that's where they came in at the, they came in the last, they were the last ones to come into Oklahoma. Uh, the Apache uh, Chiriqua, you know, the story of Geronimo. Uh, this is where Geronimo died. This is, this is the last surrendering tribes, right? In the late 1800s and um, not surrendering, sorry, they came in chains. Let me explain it uh, carefully here, but the, and, and they got the, li the least amount of resources. So, so these tribes who, who held out the longest got the least in resources. The, 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 the tribes who were least compliant got the least. Um, and so, and that's the story of the five civilized tribes as they call it in Oklahoma too. Choctaw got there first, so they, they got the most land. Cher you know, and, then, and then the other tribes that resisted got less and less and less and less. It is punitive. There is a punitive culture of control and division and, and, and uh, it's, it's constantly going on. I mean, I, it is so in our system, it's systematic racism at its best of how constantly the American government is working to, to take away power from tribes. Um, I, I think that, that just wanted to answer it very, very, it's not a monolith, everything's different in every place, but every, every story is different, but that is a constant, I think, in, in many ways too, so. And how are we surviving? Um, I was just gonna say, our tribes have done it the longest I mean, as far as cultivating our own economic systems and things and have been very successful in that regard. But the U.S. government does some very bad stuff. And I'll give you one example. They undercount. So, the, you know, dropping the census one month before the census is, is, is done for places that, especially on reservation, we have just rural, rural, rural areas. We, we're undercounted and so underfunded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to say uh, what Dan just said, that the tribes that resisted the hardest and the longest got the least. And so the tribe that risked, resisted the longest of the whole, all the tribes in the United States were the Lakota people, specifically the Oglala. And what lands did they get? They got the badlands. And they don't call it the badlands for nothing. They got, they got the um, part of the area they got, they just, white people discovered gold there. And so then they started taking that away from them, even though it was the badlands. But I did want to say one other thing about the question about language. So if you study, I speak uh, some Lakota, and when you study Lakota, you realize that uh, the language comes from nature and the language that they picked up meaning from the sounds around them. And so it's a very, very beautiful language. If you study the language of the Hopi Indians, what uh, Edward T. Hall, who wrote about it, he was a cultural anthropologist, he studied that language and said, if, if you had created a physics from their language, you would have come up with the theory of relativity. So yeah, language is really, really important. And it's important to understand the wisdom within some of these Native American tribes, because we could learn a lot from it. Jesse, did you want to add anything else um, or any concluding marks from either you or Dan at this stage? Well, just that one thing that is monolithic is that uh, the government is really trying to pull a George Floyd on, on Native American reservations. They're, mm -hmm. we, they have their knee on the neck and they're trying to slowly and quietly suffocate the Native Americans out of existence and they're still doing this to this day which is what the pipeline is all about they're really trying mm -hmm. to suffocate them out of existence quietly quietly they're trying to to really uh to uh, suffocate us quietly until there's not enough of us anymore to maintain the reservations we will have been americanized and, and that's their goal so to try to avoid that we just need awareness that native american people are still here because if you ask most Americans, they don't even know a Native American person. They haven't, they've never met a Native American person. So Native American issues aren't really in their uh, psyche, in their consciousness. So what we need is just awareness that we're still here, we're still surviving, we're still living, and uh, we should, we should uh, be, again, incorporated into the American dream. Thank you. Dan, did you want to say anything before we 
uh, have Mr. Rush wrap up for us today. No, thank you so much for allowing us to be here. Thank you. And I just want to say that I, I learned that there were five Native American congressional representatives elected in this last election. So I think if people find out who they are, no matter where you are, throw them your love and support, that would be good. Many from Oklahoma, I think. So thanks for all the Oklahomians out there. <laughs> um, Mr. Rush, how about um, you, do you have any remarks, thoughts, questions? Yes, insights? well, of course. You know, you don't ask me to make remarks. I always make remarks. It's obvious. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I want to introduce Steve. Steve Gums is uh, is one of the co-founders of Glo Global Transformation Corps, and uh, and a very influential person. Uh, and we are very grateful to have him as part of the Legacy family for the last few years. And thank you, Steve, for your contributions today, Dan. Dana Slade, who, who spoke so eloquently, has been an a intern with us, and we're surely going to miss her. Uh, and I just want to make one comment about the linguistics, because we find the same issue in, in other cultures. Khaled, if he had time, could speak to this also from the Arabic point of view. Mitra could speak to it from the Farsi point of view. But this concept of, of understanding the needs of people and their, and their culture and their consciousness is very important, exhibited by just two words in Arabic, salam and sole. And, and one, both can be translated as peace, but the latter one sole, implies reparation. So when someone is trying to talk about a peace treaty, let's say with the Palestinians and one of the Palestinians and Israelis, deeply in the consciousness of a, a lies the linguistic the remnants of a linguistic sensitivity. And so the word peace, that means more than peace. It means in that sense, reparations, and that becomes an issue. So that's just an ex another example. But thank you, Dan, from your beautiful question. And, and we're going to miss you, too. Thank you, everybody from uh, our Legacy, who's here today, and the community that's here today, and our friends and new friends who have joined us. I want to leave you with a statement passed down from White Buffalo Calf Woman. She said, friend, do it this way. That is, whatever you do in life, do the very best you can with both your heart and mind. And if you do it that way, the power of the universe will come to your assistance. If your heart and mind are in unity, when one sits in the hoop of the people, one must be responsible of one is all, and the honor of one is the honor of all. And whatever we do affects everything in the universe. If you do it that way, that is, if you truly join your heart and your mind as one, whatever you ask for, that's the way it's going to be. The seven Lakota values also given by white buffalo calf woman included praying, respect, compassion, honesty, generosity, humility, and wisdom. I think this resounds with all of us from our different traditions. We can truly see the truth is one and it has many faces and many names to it. So I wanna thank you very much for joining today. Thank you for the presentation, gentlemen. Thank you for everybody's support of the Global Viewpoints Forum. We'll be going on with that. To please take note of the fact we're doing a special gala. Go to our website and go to our auction and see what if there's anything there you'd like to participate in and help us to also to go forward and survive as, as an organization and go forward and continue to do the good work that we do. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So much. And we'd, uh, we'd love if you could stick around for just a second. Um, we we want to take a group photo. So if you want to be in it, just turn on your camera. Um, hold on one second. Here we go. All right. Three, two, one, cheese. Let me try that again. Three, two, one, cheese. <laughs> okay, awesome. And then we also have just a uh, brief announcement about the next uh, Global Viewpoints Forum in uh, yeah. a couple weeks. So thank you again, Mr. Rash, for pointing out we have a couple of, of fundraisers going on. We're really close to reaching our $20,000 goal to help guarantee the Global Youth Village continues. Um, you know, we had the work stoppage last summer, and so we're trying to recoup some operating funds. So there's an auction going on right now with some really unique holiday gifts if you want them. 
um, some good self care things, self help stuff, and some interesting items there. Um, and then also on December 5th, we're having a virtual global gala with young people from all over the world and supporters like yourself. So feel free to join that. Um, on December 9th, um, we will have our Global Viewpoints Forum featuring one of our Egyptian Professional Fellows Programs alumni. Um, his name is Abdo, and he has been, um, he's won a very prestigious award by the State Department, the Alumni Impact Award, and he has been doing um, entrepreneurship training throughout Egypt. Um, and his project really dovetailed with COVID very nicely because he was talking about creating a, a really robust and efficient remote working environment um, in Egypt. So um, it's been very timely and his, his services have been really needed. Um, so feel free to tune in on Wednesday, December 9th, and you'll find all of those announcements on our social media channels. So once again, thank you, Dan and Jesse. Um, how do you say thank you um, in, the, in your language, Dan? Uh, Yakoki. Yakoki. Yeah. That's a good word for, for us all. And Jesse, do you have a thank you you want to teach us? Alamaye. 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 Nice. <laughs> both, that, both sound so beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. If anybody wants to stay on and chat, you're welcome to. But otherwise, thank you for coming and good luck with the rest of your day, um, everybody, and stay safe and healthy out there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.